they weren't used to talking in public. And if a woman, so many women got into court because they were turbulent, got into arguments with their neighbors, made trouble in the neighborhood, supposedly. Uh, sometimes they were defending their opinions or their rights, but if they got too loud about it, well, that's, that's shrill, that's being a shrew. It was too easy to be considered that. Good evening. Uh, my name is Miriam Sear. Uh, please come and sit. We're looking for Michael Cormier, who is the author with me. Okay. Dear Michael. Um, well, I will begin, begin then by introducing um, Marilyn Roach, who's here. Um, I think what's very interesting, one of the many interesting things about Marilyn is that she is really responsible for the resurgence in a scholarship around the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, before her book, The Salem Witch Trials, a day-by-day -day chronicle of the community of a community under siege, the last book had been written in... Speak into the microphone. He's a microphone, what do you know? <laughs> Uh, around the time of the Civil War. Yes, yeah, so in the 1800s. So the book was in the 1800s by Charles Upham. And um, Marilyn uh, has written nine books uh, for adults and children on topics ranging from Thoreau to Walden to the Salem Witch Trials. And so we're very excited to have her with us tonight. Thank you, Marilyn. And then we have um, with us also, we're very lucky to have Bobby Van Gilder, um, who is uh, a teacher and uh, at Suffolk University. Uh, she's a researcher, she's a PhD and assistant professor in communication, journalism and media at Suffolk University. And she's um, researching intercultural communication, intergroup communication, and gender and sexuality studies with particular emphasis on identity, difference, and disparities. And um, she has uh, many specific lines of inquiries and we're very, very fortunate to have her here tonight with us. And then finally we have Michael Cormier. Michael, are you here? Come join us, come this way because you'll be able to you'll be able to come on stage. Oh, there you go. So you can have one. And you have one, Michael, here. And so Michael is uh, my co-author, or I should say I am his. And uh, the play is based on an original story by Michael. Uh, Michael uh, was uh, used to be a uh, lawyer, he now calls himself a reformed man, <laughs> and a reformed lawyer, and uh, we're very pleased to have him with here with us tonight uh, to talk about the Salem Witch Trials. And you have a mic right there. <laughs> right there. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. Welcome. Um, I'd like to start uh, with Marilyn and uh, uh, what it meant to be a woman in 1692. Easy questions, right? Okay, thank you. Well, in those days, women were not supposed to take the front seat in anything. It wasn't just Puritanism or Salem, it was Western culture. But, you know, don't, don't make waves in public, let your husband speak, let your father speak up. Not that everybody was so quiet, but, uh, but they weren't used to talking in public. And if a woman, so many women got into court because they were turbulent, got into arguments with their neighbors, made trouble in the neighborhood, supposedly. Uh, sometimes they were defending their opinions or 
their rights, but if they got too loud about it, well, that's, that's shrill, that's being a shrew. It was too easy to be considered that. So if a woman stepped out of turn, yeah. she was brought back. Well, yeah, you had to keep order. In a good Puritan, a good Christian, uh, believers were equal in the sight of God. But in real, in real life, you really needed hierarchy, they figured. This is Western culture. So men were a step above women. There's magistrates, and then there's people who were supposed to follow them. It, it, it was, generally, in Europe, European culture, which this was, hierarchical. It wasn't a democracy. I mean, all this talk about being equal before God, the uh, non puritan said that could lead to dangerous stuff like democracy. Apparently it did. And uh, after uh, a long time. After 300 years, where are we now in terms of women stepping out of line? Still working on it. Bobby? Um, yes, <laughs> I would agree with that. Uh, we've obviously made a lot of strides, um, which is important. So we have women actually participating um, in, in government and other types of leadership roles. But uh, women continue to be disciplined in all sorts of ways when they step out of line, um, whether it's through the criminal justice system or even just in everyday conversation. Um, and we discipline one another. Um, and so it comes in, in all shapes and forms, and so we just find more creative ways to do it, but still have a long way to go. What brought you, Michael, to want to write about Salt and Stall? Um, I had, uh, I've always been kind of a fan of the Salem, if you want to call it a fan, of the Salem witch trials. I've been kind of studying them since I was young. Um, one, right? Okay. Um, and I always kept coming across this name, Nathaniel Saltstall. And I was, uh, I was from Haverhill. And yet, you know, there was n not much talk about him other than uh, that he was a judge on the Salem Witch Trials Court, one of nine judges. And that um, there was always, everything I read, there was always one paragraph about this man. And it, that paragraph would say, Nathaniel Saltonstall was one of the, you know, the, the, the judges. And uh, he quit in protest after the first, um, uh, the first trial. And I was always fascinated because here's a, the, the one judge, the one judge out of all of them that saw through it right away and said, I won't want any part of this seems to be Nathaniel Saltonstall. But there wasn't much known about the man, so I was always curious. I always wanted to dig into how that happened and what kind of a man did this. And that's how I got started on the whole thing. I was ori originally going to write a novel about it or, a, uh, or even a, 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 a fact non nonfiction. Um, and then I kind of got challenged by uh, Punctuate 4 to uh, to work on this play, and that's how it all began. And um, when uh, the courts came together, uh, we talk about a court of Terminer and Oyer. What what was what made that court special, and why was it allowed to um, use spectral evidence? Um, a court of a special court of Oyer and Terminer is kind of a blanket. This wasn't the first special court of Oyer and Terminer ever appointed. This was, uh, all Oyer and Terminer means is hearing and determining. And uh, so this was a special court that came about because the Salem Witch Scare had been going on for, for several months. And at the time, the Massachusetts Bay Colony didn't have a charter uh, for various political reasons that would take me all night to talk about, uh, as, as Marilyn, I'm sure you know, uh, uh, it, it, all the turmoil going o on over in England caused them not to have a charter at the time. So these people were all in jail. Governor Phipps came back with the new charter from England 
uh, which had been written, believe it or not, had been passed in 1691, but he didn't get there till May of 1692. So all this time, people are in jail. He comes, and uh, Governor Phipps says, we're going to appoint a special court. That court is going to look into the witch, uh, the, the witch cases solely. Nothing else but that. It's a special court. And he appointed uh, Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor William Stoughton became the, um, uh, the chief justice of this court. Spectral evidence was allowed because in which trial, again, it's a special court and it's, it's designed specifically for the witch trials. The witch trials had allowed for centuries spectral evidence had, had been used. The thing is that spectral evidence over time it had been seen as not as uh, uh, um, n not as convincing, not as good of evidence as it had before. So it had been used sparingly and it had been used uh, 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 sort of like as collateral evidence to physical evidence. In this particular court, spectral evidence got way out of hand. And uh, so spectral evidence, I, I guess the answer is spectral evidence was not unusual for this type of a case, a witch case, but in the Salem witch trials, it was used far more than it, was in, it, it really intended to be. Bobby, talk to us a little bit about the criminal justice system today and women's place um, in it uh, in the same way these women were tried then. Are there any similarities today? Um, yes, so there are certainly similarities. The first thing that comes to mind is um, the conservatorship of Britney Spears, is the first thing that I think of. Um, but historically, the, the conservatorship it comes from old laws about guardianship. So where a father, for example, was the guardian of um, their daughter until they were married, and then the husband was the guardian um, and so women have been infantilized in that way, like their children. Um, and over centuries, they've been placed in asylums and conservatorships and, and institutions like that um, under the guise of them being protected, um, but it takes away their agency and their personhood. And so we see this play out. We still see this play out in the criminal justice system um, so just using conservatorships as an example, yes, in theory, uh, anyone can become a conservatee, um, but women are disproportionately affected, not just by being placed in those conservatorships, and, um, but also they're more likely to be abused in those conservatorships as well. And so they're not protected. Um, their rights are stripped away, their agency is stripped away, um, and other people are making decisions about them and for them. This um, court, this, these trials, they're undocumented to this day. We have no court papers. Um, is that correct, Marilyn? Uh, well, there's a, there's a, uh, oh, gosh, yes. Technology. <laughs> there are plenty of documents and questions and answers from the hearings. The trials themselves, there was a book for that, and it existed into the 18th century, but it has since disappeared. From what the Superior Court that got, uh, the per permanent Superior Court that was founded at the end of the year, which took the place of the Oyer and Terminier, and it's the same Superior Court we have now, uh, those records give the name the lists of the jurors, the charge, selling your soul to the devil, causing pain to, and suffering to the afflicted, and, uh, and the verdict. It doesn't go into a great deal, deal of detail for, it doesn't say anything about questions and answers, unfortunately, but it would be nice if it was suddenly found somewhere in an archive. But it, it was quoted from, in, le in legislature to, clear some of the first who were cleared later on. So it, it existed for a while. 
When was the latest, uh, the last uh, woman accused uh, freed of uh, her charges? Last July. Last July? Last July, I think it was the 27th. It was at quarter of eight, in the, or quarter of nine in the morning. So the governor Baker signed the latest budget, which had a number of writers to it, one of which was to clear the name of Elizabeth Johnson, Jr., who had been found guilty of witchcraft in January of 1693, one of the three who managed to be found guilty at the very end of the trials. And uh, she'd just been left out of all of the, uh, all of the clearings, the reversals of attainda until then. And uh, it, she's, she's, she's finally free of it, I'm happy to say. Uh, I have to say I'm a little stunned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, so this woman uh, is freed in last July, which uh, means that all of these women are now cleared of their charges. Yeah, women and men, because five of those who were put to death were men. But, you know, it's three to one women accused, or, or th of those that were actually executed. I think there was a greater number named as witches whose trials were either I, or whose cases were either dismissed once they stopped accepting spectral evidence or, or, or they didn't get that far. Now, Bobby, you speak about uh, Western culture and it being a male-dominated culture. Could you tell us a little more about how women fit in that and how, how today we still foster or recreate certain roles that existed even during the Salem Witch Trials? Sure. Um, so the United States is still, it's very much a patriarchal society. Um, and so throughout history, the laws have been written by men for everyone, um, but from the perspective and experience of men. And so a lot of the laws First of all, women were not even granted the most basic rights of citizenship, which is the right to vote in the United States until 1920. And even then, it was only white women. Um, women couldn't, didn't have the right to take out credit in their own name or a mortgage until the 1970s. And this, so this is very, very recent history. Um, and then even today, um, the Equal Rights Amendment still has not been um, ratified, uh, despite being introduced in the 1920s. Um, so we, we certainly have a long, long way to go. And then in many ways, we also appear to be taking steps back when it comes to women's rights. So from my perspective, for example, we can't not talk about uh, reproductive rights because Bodily autonomy is our most basic right as humans, the, the right to be recognized as full people. Um, and that has been taken away um, with abortion bans all across the states. And that's not just, well, I mean, just talking about it as reproductive rights is important, but beyond that, uh, when you take away a woman's right to make decisions about reproduction, uh, when they can have a child, how many children they can have, you're also controlling a lot of things. Um, that takes away opportunities for education. It dictates what type of career uh, a woman could pursue, where they end up in life, uh, not to mention can create a lot of financial insecurity and also threatens their physical safety. So we know that in the United States, um, women are 14 times more likely to die at child giving um, during childbirth than they are during a safe, legal induced abor abortion. Um, and so there are all of these other elements that are affecting women's lives, um, yet women and other people that are able to become pregnant don't have the power to make those choices. So, um this autonomy of women, it, they were not afforded that uh, in, during the Salem Witch Trials. What were the conditions in the jails at that time? Marilyn, if you could speak to that. Mm. What were the jails? 
Sumble wood, uh, the Boston one was stone, but uh, mainly there was no indoor plumbing. It, they were not built to hold a lot of people at once, and they were not intended to hold anybody for a long period of time. And because they were waiting for the charter to come and the government to start up again legally, uh, there were, uh, the jails were packed in three counties. So it was not it, it was not inducive to good health, and some people did die from natural causes, as the coroner's jury said. But you know, disease. Uh, they, they were crowded, and they were dark. You don't want a lot of window space for people to crawl through. Some people did escape; they had help, but not many. It was. Very unpleasant. I mean, just you put them in a small room with nothing much more than a bucket and a couple of stools and some straw on the floor, you, and you had to pay room and board. Hey, it comes out of the taxpayers' pockets otherwise. So Can you tell it, the expensive. story of how uh, uh, some women were freed of charges, but they couldn't leave the jail because they couldn't pay for their chains? Oh, uh, yeah, well whatever the charges were, yeah, then you're a debtor. And the family couldn't come up with the money in time, and some who were, were, who were found not guilty once it's, they're not using spectral evidence anymore. She had to stay behind a while and died of disease. Because she couldn't pay for she her chains. She couldn't pay for the ch well, chains, bread and water, you know. Michael, they say that the, um, so the, the accounts of the trials only came in a year afterwards. And they, it was, uh, um, uh, the governor asked Cotton Mather to write an account of the trial, and yet he wasn't at the trials. And there was a moratorium on the trials afterwards. Uh, can you speak a little bit on that? Yes. Um if, if, if I'm understanding your question, Cotton Mather was asked to give the count of, I believe it was five different trials, um, but that was it. He wrote a book called, um, Marilyn? Wonders of the Invisible World, he, it, which it gave accounts of five different trials. In fact, uh, part of my research was to read that so that I could find out about who testified at Bridget Bishop's trial. So much of what you saw tonight was not far off the mark. It was based on Cotton Mather's own writing. And he wrote about uh, some of the other trials. Um, but uh, the, there was a moratorium imposed by the governor, I think, about talking about or printing anything else uh, about the trials for I think it was a year, so that uh, people did, it really didn't get out, unless you were involved in the trials, it really didn't get out for a while what had actually happened in the trials. Could I jump in? Yeah, sure, go sure. ahead, could I jump, jump in? in? Uh, yeah, the Cotton Mather's book and a couple of the others were dated in 1693, but they were really published before that. So the news was out, and Cotton Mather had requested court papers to base the information on. He had not been at the trials. Right. But uh, he trusted that the judges knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. But whatever papers they gave him, uh, those were the cases he worked on. Right. Bobby, the play is about the plight of these women in the trials. As you were watching it, from your uh, perspective in 2022, uh, what was racing through your head? Oh, I mean, there are so many parallels to things that we're seeing right now. Um, I really enjoyed the play. I know very little about the Salem Witch Trials, so this has been really exciting for me. Um, but it's so interesting to watch something play out from so long ago and to see just so many parallels to what we're seeing right now 
in debates surrounding women's rights and in the way that um, women continue to be disciplined and put in their place. And, um, and when we step out of line, uh, we might not face the exact same consequences, but um, we are certainly still impacted in a lot of ways. Thank you. Um, I am wondering if there are questions from the audience in regards to the, the trials, questions to Bobby. So Susan is going to go through the audience and uh, offer a microphone. Oh, there's a Anyone? question over oh, there. Here we go. Thank you very much. First of all, it was an amazing play, and I really appreciate all your efforts to tell this really important story um, that has so much significance even today. My question is, I'm wondering, um, Bobby or Michael, if either of you can speak to similarities in terms of what we see today with wrongful convictions compared to um, what has happened in the past. I guess I'll start. Um, there's a lot going on these days that you might have read about or seen on, on in the news about uh, DNA testing that's uh, discovering that there are people on death row who didn't even commit the crime. I mean, think about that. People that are on death row facing, you know, uh, facing capital punishment, and it turns out that they were uh, either uh, negligently accused and and uh, their trials were not fair um, and uh, they've been languishing in jail for uh, for for years uh, you know going through the appellate process I mean they, only to discover that what they've been telling people all along was the truth they were not this has happened in many, many cases. You hear about them over and over and over again. Uh, and it's not just death row inmates, but it's, it's other people as well. In America, unfortunately, uh, the law is not, um, our legal system is slanted toward the rich and the male, and particularly white males. And that is just an absolute truth. I know this. I practiced for 23 years in the courts of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, every court in this Commonwealth. And what I found is that if you have lots of money or if you ha are you in a, any kind of a position of power um, or if the color of your skin is white, you're going to be treated differently. Women and minorities are treated differently. There's absolutely no question about it. And most of those people on death row that you see that you're finding out that they were convicted wrongfully, they had poor legal counsel, they had, um, uh, they had uh, the, pr the prejudice against them by uh, prosecutors, uh, some of which were, uh, prosecutors tend to like to move into politics, so they they need to do a good job and put people behind bars in order to get their reputation. So I think that goes on a lot. Uh, but there's no question about it. It's slanted. And it is slanted in favor of certain people. That's got to be addressed at some point in time. Um, and that, you know, I, staying on topic, very, very true of women just as well. That's the best example I can think of. Uh, uh, Bobby? Um, I would agree. Um, obviously, with regard to wrongful convictions, how long it takes um, to correct wrongful, wrongful convictions is absolutely horrifying. Um, so people can spend years even when it's very clear um, that they were innocent. Uh, and also even just the burden of proof to secure a new trial once you've already been convicted it takes a really long time and that burden of proof is really high. 
And so this is a problem I think we're going to continue to see for a long time until there is some serious criminal justice reform. So if you had a magic wand, thinking, thinking, uh, talking of magic, uh, if you were to change one thing uh, right now for uh, women, um, other than the obvious we've just talked about, with it, which is bodily autonomy, what, what would be the, the first thing you would want to address? Oh, so many things. <laughs> Um, well, topple the patriarchy, <laughs> but that might be thinking too big. <laughs> um, I would certainly like to see a separation of church and state. <laughs> um, and I would certainly like to see a lot more um, women representing us in government and on the courts. And I think that would be huge. More questions? So thank you. The uh, Stoughton comes across as an unredeemable villain in the play, and I'm wondering if the historical documents show him in the same light. Well, besides the trial court cases, there's not a lot about Stoughton, except for the political things. Thank you. There's not a lot of information on Stoughton personally. Uh, he didn't leave a diary. There aren't any personal letters, just, you know, government letters. And things. Uh, there is a biography being written about him, not by me, and uh, a lot of us are waiting to see that come out. But uh, he's kind of enigmatic, but he, he was certainly not sympathetic with the, the witches. Um, the only uh, actual um, quote in the whole play from what these people said is from Stoughton, uh, from a sermon he gave. He, he was a preacher, and if you look at... Uh, the following, if you follow his life, he was a preacher for many years. He uh, ended up not being so successful at that, so he moved into politics. He uh, he then uh, went from uh, politics to a uh, uh, mediator, to uh, to mediate the charter in London. Uh, he had huge political aspirations. He actually did become the governor of Massachusetts after Phipps and died uh, as governor of Massachusetts. And the, the quote uh, that we use that uh, is specific to him, we quote him, is the quote where he says that uh, he, uh, he is the, the, the wheat and that the, the, the witches are, are the the thorn in the plant and the vine, that's all uh, directly taken from one of his sermons. So I, if, I, I don't know if that helps. Uh. Okay. Hi. Th um, I really enjoyed the play, by the way. It, it was very moving. Um, my question is, I guess I'm dumbfounded by the whole theme about truth because um, when you see what's going on today, truth is up in the air. <laughs> and I guess my question is, has, I, I mean, I think this is critical that it needs to be, th this play should be um, shown to the masses because I think we need it desperately. <laughs> so is there any, what, what is the goal for this play? And uh, well, our, our hope very much is that uh, some patron will come along and help us put it on. So the play is looking for a champion uh, and uh, we're very uh, much hoping to find one. 
Uh, what's very interesting is when Michael and I started working on this in 2018, uh, and we really, uh, uh, that was our, our, our thing, was the fake news and truth, and what is truth, and what is, what is the, uh, and there was a line in the play that uh, we're, I'm hoping we bring, bring back, is that without truth, without a common truth, we turn on each other. Yes. And, uh, and that is really the, if you will, the meta of, of the play. But what's extraordinary is in these four years, even though the, the, play, the play continues to evolve, uh, we, you know, the mob was assembling for uh, Bri Bridget Bishop and uh, way before January 6th ever happened. And uh, so it's very interesting to see uh, that the events, the current events, uh, seem to be mar marching in step with, uh, with what happened at the Salem Witch Trials. And I think that, that um, it's, uh, it's very much a, a story for our times. Yes. And it, it's very interesting also to note that uh, John Adams, who wrote the Massachusetts Constitution, um, part of uh, his motivation behind this was uh, the Salem Witch Trials and that he, he uh, wanted there to uh, never be a possibility of a travesty of justice, as took place during the Salem Witch Trials, which is why Massachusetts has one of the strongest Bill of Rights for individuals of, of all of America. And that has to do directly with the fact uh, that the Salem Witch Trials were allowed to take place. And so we believe, obviously, punctuate four productions, and we believe very strongly uh, that this story uh, should be told. Thank you. Um, Bobby, a parting word as, as, we, as we leave this talk back. Um, I guess to not end on like a doomsday <laughs> downer, um, I think that just the amount of change that we've seen, and I will say I've been very impressed with our youngest generation and how they're really showing up. Um, it's so important that we remain vigilant and engaged. Um, and so I still believe, despite a system designed to recreate itself over and over again, that we have a lot of power, a lot of collective agency, and so vote. <laughs> That's my parting words. Marilyn? Ah, well, if something seems to be going wrong, don't panic. Make certain you've got the facts. Uh, if some, even if something seems to be possible, I mean, people then still thought that witchcraft was possible even when they stopped accepting spectral evidence. But is what you think is happening actually the problem? And even if it is, are the people you want to blame the ones who are responsible for it? Get the facts. Michael? Yes. Um, I, I agree with both things. Uh, it, I think we need to get out and vote. We can't be complacent any longer. I think that we have to fight back against untruth. Part of the problem in our society is that it's so easy to find misinformation, it's so easy to find it, it's everywhere. And we tend to rely on that because it's all over the internet, it's on your favorite station or, or, or podcast or whatever. People, you and I, uh, I'm, I'm agreeing with Marilyn, I'm agreeing with both of them. Vote, and before you vote, and before you do anything politically, get the facts. I mean, watch those TV commercials, and everything they, that they say on those commercials, almost every one of them, is factually incorrect. They just took little bits and pieces, and you gotta find out what the real facts are behind something. You've gotta do your homework. That's what a historian does, right? Primary sources, they, they, they check them, they back check them, they, uh, and, and they, um, you've got to, 
in this society today, we can't just rely on the six o'clock news. We have got to do our homework. The Salem witch trials were really brought about by a confluence of events. So for many, many years before the Salem witch trials, there were many accusations of witchery, but no one took them seriously. So what are the steps that bring a society to create a um, cauldron, a crucible, in which the Salem witch trials can exist. It takes a very unhappy population, uh, a population that doesn't feel heard. It takes people in power who are deaf to uh, a population's uh, needs and demands. It also takes a, uh, a uh, collective will to start believing gossip and rumors. And so gossip um, whispers uh, uh, is probably one of the most powerful tools that we have at our disposal to nourish and bolster our fears and misinformation. It also is the most powerful tool to tell the truth, right? So we must use our voices to counter that. Uh, and I think we're at a point now in our society where we also are starting to be at odds with each other. So I hope very much that um, stories like the Salem Witch Trials, the work that Bobby is doing, the work that Marilyn is doing, the work that Punctuate Four is doing, and also very much the work that Susan uh, is doing with the Ford Forum Hall, that brings together diverse and important opinions of people who um, make it their um, uh, careers and also their calling to uh, dig into stories. I think we must encourage those and uh, you being here does that tonight. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>